welcome all. Thank you for registering for presentation of 2021 Transform Yearbook, Capitalism's Deadly Threat. Transform Europe is a network of 40 European organizations from 23 countries active in the field of political education and critical scientific analysis, and is the recognized political foundation to the party of the European left. My name is Dagmar Schwendova. I am a member of the editorial board of Transform Yearbook and CE Strategies. It is my pleasure to open this session. Harris Golemis, Transform Yearbook co-editor and strategic advisor to the board of Transform Europe, will follow with presentation of the Transform Yearbook. We are happy to have John Bellamy Foster, editor of Monthly Review, with us today. Welcome, John. The interview with John will be moderated by Kimon Markatos, member of the editorial board. Silent moderation and Q&A box will be managed by Katarina Anasagiu, facilitator of working groups migration and global strategy, and myself. Finally, I am happy to see other two co-editors of Transform Yearbook, Walter Bayer and Eric Kanepa, who are here with us today. Before we proceed further, some technical information. Our discussion will last 60 minutes and will include open questions and comments from the audience. For questions and comments in the, uh, in the discussion, please use the Q&A box only. See the Q&A icon at the bottom of your Zoom screens. You can also upvote or like the questions of the others and by doing so, giving them priority. For introducing yourself or requesting technical support, please use the chat box. That's all for me from now. Harris, the floor is yours. Thank you, Dagmar. Well, I am very happy to, to present the 2021 Yearbook of Transformed Europe which uh, for the first time is being published by Merlin Press in both written and digital form. Before turning briefly to its uh, contents, I should say that this European, in fact, international annual journal, wh which has been published uh, since 2015 and edited by Walter Bayer, Eric Canepa, and myself, Aris Golemis, Although funded by Transform Europe, is nevertheless an independent periodical with no guidelines from the part of Transform's executive board. Our task is to provide readers with deeper analysis from a radical left point of view of several political, economic, and cultural issues of the current conjuncture of the past and of expected future developments. To achieve this, we cooperate with prominent intellectuals and younger academics, as well as with politicians, trade unionists, and activists, mainly from Europe, but also from other parts of the world. We hope to gradually take our place as a member of the family of respected radical left journals, such as Monthly Review, New Left Review, the Socialist Register, Jacobin, and others, with whom we would like to establish close relations and possibly cooperate in certain areas, exchanging articles or organizing seminars and conferences. Each Transform Yearbook has a core theme and several permanent sections. Europe, including country reports and issues of European integration, the Marxist Christian dialogue, anniversaries, and at least one interview and or round table. There is a story behind our 2021 edition. In late 2019 and early 2020, our originally planned 
theme was the climate crisis. And we already had commitments from various authors. However, the eruption of the COVID-19 pandemic was an event that we could not ignore. So we decided to divide the core of the yearbook in two parts, the ecological crisis and radical left alternatives and uh, politics and everyday life under the pandemic. With the understanding that both crises arise from disaster, from the disaster capitalism of our times, we called the 2021 issue Capitalism's Deadly Threat. Its content is summarized in the back cover of the yearbook. The current issue, it says there, looks at capitalism's impact on the world ecosystem through global warming and the current pandemic and the concomitant economic crisis with their effects on logistics and borders, the structure of work, healthcare systems, European integration, geopolitical power relations and gender relations and the economic status of women. But at the same time, the, breach, the breaches in neoliberal hegemony and the growth of system critical thinking with new labor organizing approaches and even a new socialist sensibility in the United States. We believe we succeeded as all our contributions are very interesting and of high quality. I want to refer to them first because there is no time to do so and second because my personal preferences are not the point here. But uh, I will make three exceptions. The first is the article by Luciana Castellina, a, le a legendary figure of the European left, about the hundred years from the founding of the no longer existing Italian Communist Party, once the strongest communist party in the West. The second, is Ingar Soltis' commemoration of Leo Panic, co-editor of Socialist Register, a committed left socialist intellectual and a beloved comrade and friend. The third exception is the interview of the preeminent eco-socialist John Bellamy Faust, editor of one of the internationally most significant left journals from 1949 to the present. Monthly review, monthly review in which he addresses questions related both to theory and to conjectural issues, which are strategically important for the radical left. His contribution to this issue of the yearbook and his participation in today's event is a great honor for us. I will end this introduction with a well-known British proverb. The proof of the pudding is in the eating. So for all of you who are watching this webinar now, or for those who will see it via YouTube and the Transform website, there is really only one way to find out if my praise for this 2021 yearbook is justified to purchase and read it and hopefully to keep reading it every year and recommend it to your friends. Hello everyone. Uh, I'm, I'm Timon Markatos. I'm a member of the editorial board of uh, the Transform yearbook. Uh, thank you, thank you, Harris, for uh, an introduction of Transform Yearbook's concept, as well as the, the current edition, Capitalism's Deadly Threat. Uh, I have to say that I am very happy and proud to, first of all, be presenting, finally, the 2021 issue of the yearbook, uh, both the printed and the uh, digital version, uh, this yearbook is the result of uh, much hard work 
but also it is the, uh, the result of uh, lots of solidarity and lots of love. And it is my opinion that hard work should be usually combined with those two uh, sentiments. Um, but uh, I don't wanna waste time uh, saying nice things about ourselves in the publication. You can all check it out uh, once this uh, uh, presentation is uh, over. It is my pleasure and uh, honor to welcome and introduce one of the yearbook's distinguished authors today, uh, Professor John Bellamy Foster. Um, by now, largely thanks to John Bellamy Foster, starting with a publication of his Marxist ecology, Materialism and Nature in 2000, it has gradually become untenable, at least for those who claim erudition in the field of ecological studies, to maintain that Marx had little to say about environmental issues. In this context, there is a term derived from uh, volume three of, Capital, of Marx's Capital uh, that Professor Foster put on the map, that is metabolic rift, which essentially refers to the way in which capital accumulation and capitalist social relations eventually lead to a deadly collision between human beings and the natural systems of which they are a part. In addition to developing a Marxist ecological theory, in Marxist ecology, Professor Foster provided an intellectual and social history of the development of ecological materialism before Marx, and in The Return of Nature, one of his latest publications, which was awarded the 2020 Isaac and Tamara Deutscher Memorial Prize, he traced the, the evolution of ecological thought since Darwin and Marx, and in so doing, uh, brought back to visibility the ecological thinking of many late 19th and 20th century Marxist thinkers. As a result, he has made it clear, even to many who do not identify as Marxists, that the approach of Marx and Engels and several generations of their followers is at least one of the indispensable orientations that ecological theory and any political strategy for social change has to take into account. For his life's work, he has been honored with several major awards, including the University of Oregon's Outstanding Career Award. Apart from his own theoretical work and his activity as professor of sociology at the University of, Go of Oregon, he's also the editor of Monthly Review, one of the world's major journals of independent Marxist uh, analysis in the post Second World War world. Founded in 1949, it played a key role in developing Marxian economic theory in general, and the more robust and adequate theory of imperialism in particular, immensely influential in the Latin American left and elsewhere, which led to various editions in other languages. Few expected that the journal's high level and its distinct orientation could be continued after its founder's deaths. That it was able to continue with the successor editor of Professor Foster's stature, rooted in its own orientation, while contributing enormously for influential work in an entirely new area of crucial and universal importance today, is an achievement of truly major international significance. Uh, as Harris already mentioned, and as those of you who have already gotten to read this year's issue or even parts of it, its core theme is capitalism's deadly threat. As Professor Foster's work has shown in many ways over the past years, this title could very easily describe not just the current conjuncture, and the handling of the COVID pandemic, that is capitalism as a deadly threat to us all through the exacerbation and the treatment of the pandemic, but it could very well function as a description of the deadly threat that capitalism has been over the years, particularly through its destructive effects on the environment. Uh, this very destructive nature, we could say, constitutes one of its main features since its very beginning. So to begin this conversation, I would like to focus on that very uh, historical conjuncture on our own time and age and the sociopolitical reality imposed by the COVID crisis. So given the changing conditions under which we are all living, ecology is becoming an ever more central issue to our lives and thus to left politics. 
And that brings us to the first and rather expected question for Professor Foster. What is, uh, Professor Foster, according to you, the connection between capitalism and the COVID pandemic, both in terms of its creation and in terms of its treatment by governments around the world? Well, we have no sound. Thank you for that very splendid introduction, which left me feeling humbled by um, the things that were said. In terms of, of the question of, of um, COVID-19 and capitalism, uh, the, the most direct answer is that um, COVID-19 is a product of, of uh, the globalization and uh, agribusiness in particular, the expansion of, of agribusiness across the world and uh, the destruction of uh, wilderness and eco areas, um, um, ecosystems, fairly intact ecosystems and um, the uh, spread of, um, of zoonoses um, as a result of this. Um, uh, helped along by the creation of agribusiness uh, monocultures and transmitted through uh, the circuits of capital. This analysis has been presented most effectively by Rob Wallace, uh, who's the uh, uh, epidemiologist and uh, author of, um, of Big Farms uh, Make Big Flu and more recently Dead Epidemiologists and a whole team of epidemiologists, uh, historical materialist epidemiologists, um, part of uh, Structural One Health, uh, who've, who've uh, explained these connections. As you may know, One, One Health is now the, the kind of broad uh, context in which, um, in which uh, epidemiology, spread of, um, of um, epidemics and pandemics is treated, bringing together people from various uh, disciplines, um, uh, not just the medical discipline, but biology, uh, veterinarian science, and um, all sorts of, of um, other disciplines. But the one thing that's left out of uh, One Health is a political economic analysis, the analysis of capitalism, the, the, um, the way in which uh, these pandemics are shaped by the mode of production. Uh, that's completely left out of, of the entire analysis. And so there's this tradition, which Rob Wallace is a leading figure, which has arisen out of, um, out of um, um, Marxian ep epidemiology and, and ecology, which uh, brings in the circuits of capital, the critique of agribusiness and uh, this more fundamental understanding of how globalization and commodification and particularly um, uh, ag agribusiness relations, the destruction of subsistence agriculture and, and, uh, and wilderness ecosystems and uh, the promotion of monocultures and the, the intensification of the circuits of capital globally have all uh, made us vulnerable to uh, the rise of these new zoonoses and um, uh, um, epidemics in general. And that this is not simply a one-off event uh, with COVID-19, but we, we saw it um, with earlier SARS epidemics. We saw it with many other uh, epidemics and uh, this is um, um, developing and will be part of um, of our reality now. It's essentially a part of, of uh, ecological destruction and it's, it's complicated um, by climate change. On the receiving end of this, there's the, there's the social systems and um, cap the societies that uh, are most uh, capitalist and um, where the social relations are, are most fully dominated um, by commodification and the destruction of, of, uh, of uh, community and, uh, and um, uh, well, um, public health um, 
all of these, um, the societies that are most neoliberal have been the ones that are most vulnerable to the spread of pandemic, simply because um, they've destroyed the whole social infrastructure and community and the public basis of society. And so we see the, uh, the, um, um, the pandemic filtering its way through um, the social relations of, of capitalism. And, um, and of course, it's affected by imperialism too, making some countries particularly vulnerable. And, uh, and of course, um, the vaccine apartheid is, is um, part of this. But all of it's filtered through the social relations of capitalism. We can see this um, quite clearly because, um, say, if you look at um, the United States, uh, so far, deaths from uh, COVID-19 are 2,200, a little bit more than 2,200 per million. In China, death, deaths from COVID are three per million. And I could give you other contrasts, but I think that that establishes the point that um, what happens in terms of this pandemic has very much to do with the social relations, the social institutions of capitalism and where um, this is operating in, in its purest, most extreme forms, we see the, the biggest devastation on society. I wanted to say that the, the understanding of this goes way, way back so that um, the first really great work in, in social epidemiology ever written was a work um, called The Condition of the Working Class in England, uh, written by uh, a man named Frederick Engels, uh, then um, 24 years old, uh, who walked the streets of Manchester and, and um, analyzed um, from a materialist perspective what was going on. He relied a lot of the medical reports and studies at the time as well, but none of them provided the, um, the searing indictment and the, uh, captured the full complexity of what was happening. Uh, and Engels called it social murder because um, the working class died um, uh, disproportionately in, um, from, from epidemics. And he analyzed this and uh, the other health hazards in, in general. That was the main, the, the main um, focus of his work was the environmental conditions of the working class. And this work had enormous uh, influence. Uh, 20 years later in, in Capital, Marx returned to the uh, problem of, of um, epidemiology, of social epidemiology into Engels's work. And, and Marx actually uh, connected uh, epidemics to uh, his analysis of the metabolic rift uh, directly. Uh, referring to Engels's uh, analysis. But social epidemiology really uh, starts at that point. And the, the, uh, I wanted to also mention that E. Ray Lancaster, who was, um, was uh, Darwin and, and, and Huxley's protege, the leading biologist um, in, in England in the generation after Darwin and Marx's uh, close friend, a, a socialist, um, really quite a, um, a radical socialist, but more of a, you know, um, up, um, practically speaking, more of a Fabian uh, type. Uh, he, um, he was also a, a leading uh, analyst of, um, of um, ep, you know, of, of um, disease and um, as well as evolutionary theory, um, an analyst of disease, of epidemiology. Uh, he worked uh, with Pasteur, and he became uh, one of the leading experts on, on uh, the transmission of disease in the late 19th, early 20th century. And um, uh, Lancaster was the first to argue that all, all um, epidemics, all pandemics that um, we know, both in, in animals and humans, um, are caused by, by uh, human beings, by uh, 
our mode of production and particularly capitalism, commercialism and finance. And those structures, he argued, um, uh, generated uh, uh, epidemics. And uh, he illustrated this in the context of imperialism as well with uh, analysis of the African sleeping sickness. And he called this the revenges of nature, which is very re reminiscent of uh, Frederick Engels's mention of, uh, of uh, of the revenge of nature in in uh, the dialectics of nature. So and and Marxian epidemiology as and historical materialist epidemiology has gone on from that point. In two thousand, um, uh, 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 Richard Levins had an article in Monthly Review, September two thousand, I believe it was, called "Is Capitalism a, D a Disease?" where he explained that. The spread of pandemics in this manner um, was was something that was happening, and that was going to expand uh, in the 21st century in the next few decades. And uh, we have many other uh, thinkers who've been exploring this. Uh, Howard Whiteskin. So this is not new, but for most Marxist theorists, since um, they've been divorced from science. The, the fact that there is this analysis and that historical material epidemiology or structural one health is the most advanced analysis of this in the world is not really well known, but we should know it and we should, we should integrate it into our analysis. Thank you very much. That was a fascinating answer and uh... I can see we already have interesting questions, uh, which we'll have to wait for the uh, Q&A uh, section of today's presentation or discussion. Uh, but uh, the discussion so far actually brings me to uh, another relevant question that I wanted to ask you. Uh, in your interview at the yearbook, you commented on your expectations or rather your lack of expectations from the Biden administration with regards to the ongoing climate crisis. Uh, and you also commented on, well, the possibility of China changing the tide in the global treatment of the climate crisis. Would you now say, it's been almost a year since Biden's election, that anything has changed in a positive direction or are things more or less the same? For example, in comparison to the Trump administration. And, would you still place more hope in China than in the West uh, with, with regards to the uh, treatment of the climate crisis? Well, um, the Biden issue is 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 rather complex. Um, he was, you know, uh, as opposed to um, the um, other candidates um, in the U.S. election. Uh, he opposed a Green New Deal. Um, Bernie Sanders had a, 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 gr a Green New Deal quite um, ambitious and, and really up to the task. Um, Warren uh, had a Green New Deal proposal that was much less. Um, Biden basically uh, had none. And um, conforming with what he told uh, Wall Street that there there would be no changes under his administration. So, um, although there's there were two trillion dollars budgeted for for um, um, related to climate change um, uh, over a number of years um, in in Biden's program. That's only uh, one sixth of what uh, Bernie Sanders was talking about, totally inadequate and not really directed to what needs to be done. So um, there was that problem from the start with the Biden administration and was quite clear that um, it was going to operate pretty much like the Obama administration had in this respect of sort of neoliberal uh, uh, approach. What, what Biden did is uh, turn around uh, a lot of the uh, executive orders that Trump had instituted, he he reestablished uh, uh, relation to the the Paris um, Agreement on um, part of the United States. Uh, turned around a lot of the the um, environmental uh, measures that had been 
overturned uh, by Trump, putting them back in place. But in terms of real action on on climate or environment, um, it's not it's not happening, and um, it's mainly because um, Biden is completely within the the corporate orbit. Now, if you, in fact, the the tragic thing, although it's not really um, Biden's fault entirely and Biden administration's fault, is that the uh, carbon emissions in 2021 in, in the United States um, are projected to rise um, by the second highest uh, level in all of recorded history for the US. This is partly because they're coming out of, um, of uh, an economic crisis where in 2020, um, there was negative gro growth and carbon emissions dropped by 11%. Um, but um, just to show how bad it is, is that in 2021, according to the Energy Information Agency, the coal emissions are, are projected to increase in, in the United States by 21% over uh, the previous year. So this is not, and meanwhile, the Biden administration is authorizing new pipelines and, and so on. So um, you, you might be able to say it's a smidgen better in terms of policy, but it still takes us over the cliff just about as fast. And, um, and um, this is um, nothing, um, there's nothing here um, so far to, um, uh, suggests that any hope whatsoever from what the Biden administration is doing. It all depends on the larger society and, and movements. In China, it's different. Um, when I gave that, you know, I did the, the interview um, shortly after Xi um, surprised the world by, by um, saying that China, which is an emerging economy, not an advanced economy, uh, is um, was going to um, reach near net zero carbon emissions before 2060, which was something that nobody expected or even dreamed of as possible. It's just not, you know. And um, since then, um, I mean, of course, they were doing uh, more, they were doing a lot towards climate change before then. China is the leader in the world in, in, in solar energy, both in the technology and in the institution of it, and in wind power and, uh, and uh, electric vehicles and uh, all of those things. The big problem in China has been its dependence, heavy dependence on, on coal, which is you know, its main fossil um, fuel and um, and uh, moving away from coal is 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 decisive, and uh, so this has uh, been a fundamental problem. But the and of course China is growing at a, a high rate, um, solving an ecological problem while with a high rate of growth that really requires an ecological modernization strategy of some sort, where you you decrease the the carbon input per, per um, um, uh, I, you know per um, dollar of growth and, um, or um, whatever currency you want to put it in. And, uh, the, um, and uh, China's doing that more aggressively than anywhere else in the world. Well, a lot, there's a lot of talk about ecological modernization, but theirs is more aggressive. It's, and it's product of the social relations that are different. They did have a revolution. They have different social relations. They were able to implement things um, more uh, faster, more readily with, they actually have planning in their economy. They have still have the five-year plans. So this is, um, so just look at what's happened. Just um, the, the changes are, are um, extraordinary. Just in like the last couple of weeks, um, there's a report coming out on, on China's for, uh, uh, reforestation, afforestation, program, which is the greatest in all of uh, human history. There, um, China last week ended all subsidies for, um, for, um, for coal-fired plants um, in, 
in the rest of the world. It no longer, and announced it will no longer finance or subsidize coal-fired plants in Africa, where it was going on and, um, and elsewhere. Uh, it, um, China has just announced that it's putting solar panels, uh, I mean, it's, it's converting the roofs um, of, of all public buildings into solar panels, right? The, the, um, the, um, the speed with which they're making these changes just in the last week, they've enormously increased the price of carbon, which has created all sorts of, of a little bit of chaos and, and, uh, and, and confusion. But the, the fact is that they're forcing up the price of carbon. The biggest problem in China is, um, and it does have this, um, is working on, on the notion of ecological civilization, and it does, uh, it has put this as a top priority now. But the biggest problem in terms of, uh, of China is the, the, um, the fact that their fiscal system is actually very, very decentralized. So local governments and, and the corporations that are localized um, have enormous power within the economy in, in, in terms of production decisions so that the central government, which is pushing for environmental change, can't um, um, gets a lot of pushback from, uh, from local governments that want more coal-fired plants and so on. So there's a struggle going on in China. There's also the rural revitalization program in China where they're they're um, trying to restore ecological relations and to um, and to um, actually promote prosperity and and uh, equality in the rural areas, which is part of all of this. So there's, you know, we have to look. We we uh, we have to believe in struggle. We have to believe in hope. We have to look where where things are happening and see what we can learn and how we can build on it. And I think that China is offering some hope. It's, there's reason to be skeptical. There's uh, reasons to think that they might fail. But the fact is that they're, they're taking this on in a big way, which is, um, is quite extraordinary, P particularly looking at um, the um, failure in the United States to do anything, really. Um, it's, it's, it's a policy of drift. Uh, somehow they think that corporations are going to drift their way out of this, um, and um, and that um, uh, capitalism will will just since it's such efficient an efficient system, we're always told it will it will lead us out of this. But it's only efficient in terms of promoting the accumulation or the amassing of wealth. It's not efficient in terms of human development or even survival. Thank you very much. But um, uh, capitalism, as we know, is a global system. China's economy and China's production is very much tied to, tethered to uh, other economies around the world, and most especially that of the US. Uh, what I want to get to is, uh, wouldn't you say that there is a limit to what uh, even a, a political system as that of China can do? when the rest of the world keeps on uh, producing and consuming with the logic that it still produces and consumes. Well, yeah, I mean, the, 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 the climate problem is a global problem. It needs some um, ecological revolution across the globe. Then the, the um, interesting thing is, where does the momentum develop for this? Um, I've thought, well, maybe there could be a momentum arising out of the Chinese, China, US rivalry. I mean, basically the big powers have the power to shift this. And um, whether that will happen, um, you know, we, we, it's, um, it, it may not seem probable, but, um, but um, we have to hope um, that that can happen. China is basically, um, breaking in this with uh, what has become standard in the West, and maybe that will uh, shake things up. But you think of it in terms of the latest IPCC report, I, I forget what it is, um, 
its uh, IPCC report explains the AR6, the sixth uh, assessment report uh, in the leaked, in the leaked um, part two report, um, it, uh, it in, I mean, leaked part three report on, on mitigation, it, it explains that something like 15 or 20% of, of the production of in the, in the global south, and I think probably a higher percentage in China or at the, the higher level, um, is is should be credited to um, the north since it's all you know as part of globalization it's all um, going into production I mean consumption in the north and not in the global south so that that um, we we have to recognize yeah this is a globalized system it's all interconnected and the truth is that most of the problem. Most of the emissions up in you know, that, well, most of the carbon in the atmosphere, the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, was put there by uh, Europe and the United States. And um, they uh, also have the highest per capita emissions. And they are the wealthiest countries. And they're the countries with the technology. So the, um, the real, um, um, responsibility for dealing with this uh, lies there, and um, and we can't um, we can't pretend that all countries are equally responsible. They're not, um, and we can't pull the ladder up on all the other countries of the world once we've we've climbed up. So the responsibility is pr principally in in the uh, center capitalist countries. Again, thank you very much. Um, we have time, I, I have time to ask you one more uh, question and I will uh, use the phrase you, uh, you used. You said uh, that the momentum of China, that China could function as the beginning of a momentum. Um, so I will use that phrase uh, to turn back to, uh, to turn our discussion back to your work in particular. Um, uh, your your uh, book, Marxist Ecology, was a path-breaking work for various reasons, but one of the most significant uh, ones was that it dispelled the belief that Marx had no serious conception of nature, uh, or even more so that Marx understood socialism and communism as a subjugation of nature. Uh, and of course, your your work since then. Uh, has played a significant role in, in pushing left movements and parties and intellectuals around the world to acknowledge a deeper connection between Marxism and ecology. Um, but would you say that the conditions now are better with regards to the possibility of, of the creation of a left bloc focused more particularly on questions of ecology and capitalism? Uh, that the, the conditions are now ripe for a left that focuses more specifically and more exclusively on the environment and the destruction of the environment as a basis through which to form its program. Oh, well, yeah, the conditions are more ripe. And um, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't say that my book, Marx's Ecology or The Return of Nature were responsible for this. I think that the conditions are ripe because of, of capitalism itself. and. Uh, capitalism's deadly threat to coin a phrase. So a revolutionary situation really um, in Marxist theory arises when, when the struggle for freedom, which is always uh, taking place, coincides with the struggle for necessity. Um, when, the, when we have to um, fight for freedom and survival at the same time, Marx made that clear and Engels in the German ideology, uh, but it's, it's absolutely fundamental. If you look at Engels' condition of the working class, he's really talking about um, what I call an environmental proletariat that's struggling not only for freedom, but for life, for survival, uh, fighting against the destructiveness of the system. And we now have that 
revolutionary situation emerging on a global scale, where it's now a struggle for freedom and a struggle for survival. And um, people are, are um, inherently, and this is just a materialist understanding of the world, being affected by that. And you can see that um, everywhere. I, I was um, corresponding with a, a scientist uh, today, and he said, well, um, he said that uh, he thought that capitalism could be politically corralled on the issue of, of the climate, but now he realizes it can't. Um, capitalism has to be transcended. But this realization is occurring everywhere, and it's occurring at the top and the bottom of society. There are splits at the top occurring. So all of this is important. Uh, Marx's ecology was very important, um, much more important than I realized. The book is most famous for um, developing Marx's notion of metabolic rift, which is was Marx's notion. And um, and uh, but also it would the the book it's, it as a whole was 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 reconfiguring Marx's whole notion of materialism. What is materialism in Marx's sense? And reconnecting the, the um, materialist conception of nature to the materialist conception of history. Uh, Marxists, um, at least in philosophy and social sciences, had forgotten all about the materialist conception of history. Um, um, the, uh, I mean, materialist conception of nature. They thought that ma materialism just meant economics or just meant uh, practical activity. They had no idea of, of human beings as part of an objective world um, in which um, um, there's a dialectic of nature and society. So this, um, and um, reconstructing uh, Marx's argument on that particularly as materialism and how it related to the metabolic rift was, was crucial and it's generated, um, it's generated um, analyses um, in the sciences and social sciences and the arts all over the world in movements it has been the, the, the analysis of the metabolic rift got expanded into uh, a method, I mean, using Marx's method to explore all sorts of ecological problems, to organize uh, uh, social movements, eco-socialist movements, the phenomenal influence um, in discussions in China and Latin America, and the reason is not simply because of the analysis in the book, but because it's organically connected to Marx's entire uh, critique of capitalism. The uh, political economic critique and the ecological critique in Marx are two sides of the same coin. And there's actually no other analysis in the world today that connects um, the social and and natural scientific analyses and, and relates these to movements in the way that Marx's method, which I simply elaborated, does. Um, in the return of nature, there's a different problem. Well, there were two levels to the argument. One is to explain how um, uh, socialism and ecology were actually intertwined in the century after uh, the deaths of Darwin and Marx, uh, particularly in Britain, um, and uh, and that it, it carried forward all the way to to uh, the development of the ecological movement in the 50s, 60s, and 70s. To explain that story, which um, uh, hadn't been um, understood, certainly wasn't going to be uh, explained in the mainstream, but the, the fundamental role that um, that uh, socialists had 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 in the development of the entire uh, ecological critique, the basic concepts like um, ecosystem analysis, which was based on metabolism, the how this um, developed. Um, Lancaster, I, I mentioned before, his student, Arthur Tansley, who was also a Fabian style socialist, and involved in a materialist critique, um, introduced the uh, concept of ecosystem uh, and, um, in, and um, in imposing eco-fascist uh, views that were developing at the time. But he introduced the concept of ecosystem using 
also the systems theory of um, Hyman Levy, British Marxist mathematician to develop it. This is just an example of what was happening, much of it inspired by Engels's dialectics of nature. The, so the other level of the analysis has to do with the dialectics of nature. Dialectics of nature has long in what we call Western Marxism, but is probably better called, better named post Lukacian Marxism. Uh, and, but in Western Marxism and Western Marxist philosophical tradition, the dialectics of nature was, was thrown out. Basically, the idea was that um, the dialectics um, related to the identical subject subject object it it, re it related simply to the realm in which human uh, thought and action directly uh, pertained and um, what Engels and what Lukacs in fact called the merely objective dialectics of uh, um, you know, pertaining to uh, the natural realm uh, or, or even the dialectics of nature and society were thrown out. So Perry Anderson could say in, I don't know, in the 1980s, that there was no Marxist connection to science in the country that had had who the most famous Marxists uh, who were dominant figures in their time were all natural scientists and had put forward many of the, the fundamental ecological views that led to the the rise of the ecological critique or that were fundamental to the ecological critique, to um, ecological movement and science as we understand it today, they were simply disappeared because if they were scientists, they couldn't be Marxists. And if they were Marxists, they couldn't be scientists. And then Marxists couldn't really have anything to do with nature because that would be positivistic. But meanwhile, I mean, the, um, the global ecological crisis expanded. And um, we're learning a little bit about what Engels referred to metaphorically as the revenge of nature. If we don't look at how uh, society interfaces with nature and we don't learn from our own traditions in this respect, uh, we cannot build and develop the kind of analysis we need in, the particular, in this particular historical moment. Thank you very, very much. Uh, now we have to uh, go to uh, the Q&A uh, part of today's presentation. And I give the floor to Dagmar Svendanova. Uh, thank you again very, very much for this discussion and for being with us today. Thank you very much, John and Kimon. Uh, this was indeed a really interesting exchange, and I think that it will be worth also to uh, listen to it once more uh, at later stage when we have it on the YouTube and on Transform website. But now the time has come for our audience. Uh, I see there are quite a few questions in the Q&A box. Um, we wanted to have a one hour uh, exchange and debate, but I hope that the audience will stay with us a little bit longer to have uh, to allow uh, to hear your responses to the questions given. So uh, without further ado, uh, I will read the first one. It comes from Antonin Horchica. I hope I am uh, pronouncing it correctly. If not, I am sorry. So here it comes. I like re uh, reading the articles in the monthly review. Thank you, uh, thank you for your great work with the development of the eco-socialism. Uh, eco Can you compare the American and the European approaches to solving the, this climate crisis? Can uh, Sanders or AOC GND uh, be compared to the European Union's Green New Deal? Have you had a chance to see the alternative Green New Deal for Europe created from uh, the DM25 movement, inspired by the OCC and Sanders? The yearbook list uh, the authors Adler and Vargan, who were involved in the preparation of this alternative GNDE. If so, what is your opinion on this program? So actually multiple questions there, John, you can also see it in the Q&A. Uh, if you have not got it, please open the Q&A and you, uh, you can read it once more. 
and I ask you to to try to be uh, not uh, not brief, but you know concise, so we we have a chance to go for at least one or two more questions. Thank you very much, John. Well, I can be short on on this question because because I'm not really. Um, properly informed on the European Green New Deal. I, I, haven't, I haven't followed it specifically, so I, I'm not um, able to answer that. I, I, there are various forms of the uh, Green New Deal. Obama er originally introduced the Green New Deal when he came into office. I mean, he, he ran it on the, he ran um, uh, for president saying he was going to introduce a Green New Deal and then and then um, dropped it once he was elected. And there have been various versions of the Green New Do the Deal. There's a sort of a corporate and Keynesian approach. There's an approach, what we call the People's New Green New Deal, which um, AOC and even more Sanders represent, and the Green Party even more than, uh, the US Green Party even more than them, where, where um, the principles are, are um, much broader, protecting frontline communities, um, um, class, uh, just transition, uh, environment, uh, combating environmental racism, and uh, the whole um, basically strategy of the left from the bottom up are emphasized in, in the People's Green New Deal. I imagine, though, I. I don't know that the European Green New Deal is more like the corporate Keynesian approach, but that's but I may be wrong. What we need is is a, a people's new uh, Green New Deal, and that is the least um, um, discussed uh, in in government circles, unfortunately. Thank you very much, John. Uh, I will proceed with the further questions. We are other five to go, if we manage, <laughs> if you stay with us. So uh, despite the correctness of, of Rob uh, Wallace's analysis of relations between capitalism, globalization, and agribusiness and pandemics, could it be possible that in the current case of COVID-19, the relation is not directly given by the way is the question if China, where the virus came to a human, is capitalistic? Um, I'm not not sure I caught the the question. Is it um, yeah, China is you know China China is um, not a not a society that's um, completely socialist, even by its own ideology. And uh, neither is it um, a keep completely capitalist society. It is a society that is, at least in, in its own terms, trying to an effect a transition, which it calls socialism with Chinese characteristics, where it's introduced um, market the market and elements of capitalism, but it seeks to uh, control these through, through uh, the role of the party and and the dominance, strategic dominance of of um, of state corporations, state-owned corporations. So it's, yeah, the um, China and Rob Wallace says it's. I mean, China is integrated in into the global capitalist system. That's the only way they could have uh, grown um, strategically. It would probably, um, well, there's no no path, no conceivable path to where they are now, where they didn't integrate with the uh, world economy, which is the capitalist world economy. And so this has affected them as well. But the hope in China lies in, in the their attempts to, to resurrect uh, the revolutionary process, uh, what they call the or original aspirations uh, and um, of the revolution in this period, which um, uh, is taking the form of a greater emphasis on quality, but also on, on the environment. Um, 
John, thank you. Uh, stay with China a little bit longer. I will uh, merge two questions about what uh, climate policy uh, uh, in China. Uh, do you think Europe or North America could or might feasibly take up? And this follows uh, by uh, currently, uh, but currently the production of solar panels in China is based on electric current, uh, current produced in coal fire uh, plants, isn't it? Uh, the, um, I'm not sure. <laughs> What the um, I, I lost the last part of the question. The um, the uh, Europe and and the problem with Europe and and um, North America taking up what China is doing is that is is again the social relations of production uh, in our society as compared with our theirs. So um, we don't have a principle in in the in the let's say the so-called advanced capitalist world profit and accumulation actually determine everything we don't actually have um, um, a structure where we can put anything ahead of that look at um, the deaths from COVID-19 in the United States that's avoidable um, but the, the problem is that um, uh, the problem, again, is the profits are being put ahead of, of um, people. Whatever you can say about China, um, in responding to COVID-19, they didn't put profits ahead of people there. They, in, they reinstituted um, uh, the, the notion of a people's revolutionary war, as Wang Hui has explained uh, to um, to um, deal with um, COVID-19 and to protect their population um, and uh, quite above and before any economic issues. Um, that's um, so it, it has to do with um, the social relations of production and that's what we have to fight over. That's why we, we actually need an ecological revolution um, in China as well, but um, particularly in the West, in order to be able to deal with these, these um, well, capitalism's deadly threat. Thank you very much. Uh, I will ask you. and critically support the transition from fossil to the renewable energy, transition from fossil to electric cars, which has more in common with keeping profit margins uh, steady than with saving the planet, uh, planet. Should we argue for transition from energy intensive economy as much as for the transition to renewable energy? Question asked by Zdravko uh, Zaveski. Well, if, if you look at the, um, the leaked um, part three of um, the sixth assessment report of, um, of, of the, the IPCC, which is not to be published until March, and they'll read you know, they'll, they'll, um, the governments will enter in and, and uh, redact it um, before that. But if you look at the, the leaked report, uh, they say that the only way in which we can we can um, we can conform to the the most viable strategy, the most optimistic, and really the only um, uh, uh, some climate scenario mitigation scenario that will will work uh, that will keep us get us to lower than 1.5 degrees again by the end of the century or the beginning of the 20th second, second century. In order to do that, they say the only viable strategy at this point is a low energy strategy, um, which has been actually promoted by, by analysts from the deep growth circles, particularly Jason Hickel and, um, and Andrea Malm. Um, Marxist thinkers who are who are referred to in the IPCC report, and uh, 
basically the low energy strategies that, that curtail demand as an emergency measure, but also uh, promote equality and prosperity for, uh, for the population can reduce our energy by 40 percent energy use by 40 percent very rapidly uh, while improving human lives and there's no other strategy there's no technologically based strategy um, that can achieve that at least in in um, the west we need to develop the the technologies and uh, technologies that move away from fossil fuel energy, but that isn't enough and we can't move fast enough. It requires actually a change in the social relations and the demand. And that's what the IPCC report is actually saying, although it's, um, you know, the leaked version of it. They say in the report that, um, referring to figures like Andreas Malm, that capitalism is quite likely uh, unsustainable. In fact, they, they emphasize at various points that capitalism is unsustainable. We need a fundamental structural uh, social change across the planet. This is what the IPCC report is saying. They should have said it a long time ago, but, but this, is, this is the only answer we have right now. We have to affect uh, energy. And this isn't just a matter of consumption. Uh, it's a matter of people cutting their consumption. The only way to do it is to mobilize the entire population uh, or for the whole entire population to be mobilized to affect production as well as consumption. And that requires an ecological revolution. And that may seem improbable, but, but um, the IPCC report, the leaked part two says that if we, we um, the Anthropocene evolves into an Anthropocene extinction event, and we destroy um, the species across the planet, most of uh, living species, including the human species. Evolution will bring life back, but it won't bring the human species back. And that is in the IPCC report. That is the kind of question we're faced with today. And yes, we have to contain our energy use. We don't have to produce all the garbage um, that we're producing now, much of it which is oriented towards the repression of the population. The US military itself produces more carbon emissions than 140 countries in the world. John, thank you very much. One is from Antonin Hoshchitz. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, it brings us nicely uh, to what is the Marxist approach to the concept of Degarov? Well, it's complicated because degrowth can mean a lot of things. Degrowth is that the, in the post Second World War period, they, they introduced the concept of growth um, to refer to to the increase in, in gross domestic product, uh, which was a new kind of accounting system of national economies based on, on, back, on capitalist bookkeeping, based on, on the way uh, the capitalism accounts um, for income, and, uh, but expanded to the national level. And so um, what we call growth um, it's, it's become, people don't even question it. Growth equals the same thing as, as uh, it means growth in GDP. So if we, um, uh, if we put money into the military, that promotes growth, uh, be, passes through the market and promotes growth. Um, if we, um, uh, save the life of a human individual being human being it doesn't matter that doesn't affect growth one way or another um, the um, the whole accounting has nothing to do really with human development it simply has to do with the market and it's a form of capitalist accounting so then when you talk about degrowth you're just inverting that and saying oh well we need to have 
smaller nuclear power plants or you know smaller forms of what we um, now have. Now the best degrowth theorists like D Jason Hickel don't do that. They focus on the qualitative aspects, but to the the term degrowth tends to make it look like it's just a quantity problem, not a question of the system, the qualitative nature of development. And so it gets us into this sort of trap. Yeah, the degrowth analysis is, is basically right. Then there are degrowth theorists like Sergei, Sergei uh, Latouche, who, who argue that uh, we can have degrowth and have capitalism too. Uh, I was just, um, there's just a a breakthrough institute just be introduced an article that um, criticizes me and others um, saying that capitalism uh, is the best way to have a, a zero, a degrowth economy, have a zero growth economy, that capitalism will deliver that, um, um, and uh, which is absolute nonsense. But if you just leave it, you know, in terms of just the concept of degrowth, um, which, which technically means no net um, capital formation, um, uh, the, um, and at least in terms of zero growth, no net capital formation. If you, you just leave it at that and don't get into the qualitative questions of the system, um, you can get trapped. And uh, so that's the problem. Um, and uh, like, is growing a forest, is that a problem um, from the standpoint of climate change? Uh, no, um, but growth requires cutting down for us, right? <laughs> and, uh, so, I mean, how do we how do we talk about these things? I think the answer is to talk about socialism. We talk about eco socialism, where we're talking about a different society, not simply a different um, uh, level of output, and and incorporate the what is true and and correct uh, in the degrowth analysis within an overall eco-socialist analysis, which is more critical, which deals with social relations and qualitative relations and historical development and so on. And of course, one other thing is that some degrowth theorists think that degrowth should be applied to uh, the global south. Well, um, yeah, but um, the real issue is to, to have a per capita um, energy use in the world that is equal. And uh, our analysis tells us that Italy is, is about at the level of where per capita emissions have to be used. Um, per capita energy emissions, energy use has to be in order to have a sustainable planet. That isn't um, uh, a terrible place to be. And especially if production is organized more rationally. So, you know, we have to speak as eco socialists, and, um, but I don't think eco socialists are opposed to degrowth analysis. They simply find it inadequate. John, thank you very much. I think the questions get more and more uh, difficult to, to answer <laughs> since their complexity and the answers are not an easy one, surely. I think we will have a lot of discussions about all these aspects uh, which were addressed just now, and it's important to, to have the opportunity to share them uh, in the way you did now. But I will ask uh, our co-editor uh, of the yearbook, Harris Colamis, for the final question. Harris, the floor is yours. Please unmute yourself. I was muted, so now I'm unmuted. Okay. Well, John, um, what is the place of ecofeminism in your understanding of eco socialism? Uh, you see, in, in our next year issue, we will interview Ariel Saleh, who is preparing a new book on the subject. Are you more close to her views or to those of, of Nancy Fraser, a very good friend of ours, who, who wrote an extended article in uh, the January, February 2021 New Left Review supporting the need for a trans-environmental eco-socialism. 
Well, I'm actually much closer to Nancy Fraser's views today on, on this, although um, Ariel and, and I have, have um, worked together and, and overlapped in some ways, but um, Ariel Celeb. But Nancy Fraser has been developing a form of analysis, which we have also developed um, in, in the extension of the metabolic rift analysis. And that is um, when we look at capitalism, uh, its relation to the environment, um, we have to look not only at the metabolic rift, but what lies behind this. And that's essentially the robbery of nature, um, the, um, a relation to nature that's non-reciprocal. And the, it can be explained in terms of the expropriation of nature, um, um, not appropriation of nature, because the appropriation of nature is basic to all life, as Marx said. Um, and, and so is property in one form or another, but the expropriation of nature, basically appropriation without equivalent, or as Marx sometimes said, um, 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 appropriation uh, without exchange, but appropriation, um, um, appropriation uh, without equivalent that um, is, a, is a form of robbery. And what, you know, Marx, Marx criticized as so-called primitive accumulation um, was, he, that wasn't his term. Uh, he criticized it because it wasn't accumulation at all. It was expropriation as he explained. It was the expropriation of nature that made it, a, you know, the robbery of nature that made capitalist exploitation possible. But it wasn't just the expropriation of nature, it was also expropriation of human beings. Um, through imperialism, through racism, expropriation of human bodies, right? So this integrates with the whole issue of racial capitalism. And it was also the expropriation of, of um, women's labor in the household. And this is where I'm closer to Nancy uh, Fraser than Ariel Celeb, because the, it's not that in the Marxian theory, uh, um, which is really explaining how capitalism works, how capitalist valorization works. Capital does not valorize uh, labor in the household and it isn't labor that occurs via exploitation in Marxian terms. Um, capitalism doesn't work that way in relation to the household. What it does is, is not ex, um, um, exploit household labor so much as expropriate it and expropriate uh, women's, the, the, the use values that people, um, that women produce in the household and also in case of subsistence agriculture. Now this isn't an apology for capitalism or it's not um, ignoring the problem. The truth is that robbery um, is, is an ex which expropriation is, is worse than exploitation. Women, um, and Marx said, were slaves to the household. Um, they, um, and their bodies, their use values, their production was expropriated in his terms, just like um, the bodies of slaves in the, in, in the transatlantic slave trade were expropriated. And nature is expropriated. The truth is that capitalist value relations depend on a larger realm of the expro expropriation of nature and human beings, and and um, and the, and um, a whole set of uh, phenomena in those terms that we have to analyze. And the expropriation of nature, taking from, from nature without reciprocity, robbing um, the natural world that is not operating in a sustainable way in relation to the natural world. That's what the metabolic rift is all about. That's the cause of it. And we have to reverse that. So Nancy Fraser uh, is interesting in that she's connected social um, reproduction theory um, coming out of feminism with, with the theories of racial capitalism and to some extent with the theory of metabolic rift. And we in our analysis month review say in The Robbery of Nature, which I wrote in 2020 with um, Brett Clark, uh, we're trying to draw the same connections, um, understanding that this is the way in which we have to look at 
capitalism's expropriation of the world, which is ultimately um, the problem. Um, uh, and the, because it's the basis uh, for the exploitation. The expropriation of the world is a, a realm of destruction. Uh, exploitation takes away from people their self-activity, their control over the labor process. So um, the struggle and freedom and necess necessity um, involve um, dealing with all of these parameters at once. Thank you. Thank you very much, John. Uh, let me uh, say that it was really a pleasure having you as the author uh, in our yearbook 2021 edition, and even more to have you now at the presentations with all these uh, excellent, excellent feedbacks and the answers we have, uh, we have received. I would like to thank at this point to all our colleagues who are cooperating on the yearbooks. Uh, for the silent moderation to Katarina Anastasiu, who you see now on your screen. Thank you very much, Kat. I would uh, very much like to thank all the audience, all the participants of uh, today's uh, yearbook 2021 presentation. I very much hope together with the whole editorial board that you have not only enjoyed uh, this e event today, but you will find uh, the way to purchase the book in the hard copy or in our electronic version as the ebook. I will share the, the, all the links at the end of the session. So stay with us if you do not have it yet. I very much hope that you will be also interested in perhaps following uh, the activities of Transform Europe, uh, visiting our website, subscribing to our monthly newsletter, which is issued in five langu different languages. You can also follow us social media, through our social media, you can surely like us, you can, you know, uh, share, uh, share uh, your impression from the yearbook, quote, give us also some recommendations for the next editions, uh, uh, come back to us with the interesting tips for the communications with our readers as well. So, Please feel free also after, uh, after today's session, anytime during the year, get in touch with Transform and don't be hesitant to contact us. Thank you very much once more. Enjoy the, thank you very much once more.